Oh yeah, g'day fellas, and uh, welcome back to another Fido Daily. And today we'll be exploring Vega, a hot new prospect in 14.9. I think he has some fantastic matchups in the meta right now. Asol, uh, Ari, you know, Azir, uh, Sindra LeBlanc. These are all pretty simple uh, cookie cutter Vega matchups where he can get through lane with an advantage or at least even and absolutely run away with the uh, with the game. This is the page that's been taken Vega by storm in the Korean solo queue. It's the airy page that allows you to sort of uh, maintain presence in lane, but you always take that cool cooldown reduction rune on the right hand side instead of attack speed instead of the double adaptive you take the cooldown reduction rune you play to stack your Q as much as you can you play for airy poke right you're not playing for the full combos with the E you're just playing to airy poke it's a different play style but I will show you in the video how to make the most out of it Jumping straight into the action, guys. We're walking for a late invade on the Graves. We watered his buff, saw that he solo started it, and pushed him off. But the danger of this is that you do pay a hefty price walking back to mid lane. You have to walk a very predictable way, right? And your opponent can sort of walk with you on auto attack. You would get very lucky that Hui does not have an attack speed rune. That is why I'd always recommend you run attack speed on Hui, so that if you know if you can get on top of your laner, uh, you're able to just walk with them and smack them because Hui attack animation is fantastic. Uh, so luckily, he went double adaptive AP, and we were able to kind of get away with the the bare minimum HP loss there and when you do get back to lane on Vega I'd say that the way you think about laning should just be if your Q is not being stacked off cooldown you're doing something wrong right so it's important to start prepping creeps. You don't have to try and go for two, uh, you know, two last hit cues. I think that's the one thing that people get wrong on Vega. Like when you have low CDR in the early game, right? It's unrealistic to expect to get two uh, last hits with your Q because having two, two, two CS that is very, very low that you're forced to go for with your Q uh, makes your movement also very predictable. It can open you up to trade. So uh, just in general, you know, feel free to sort of just be happy with, with Casting Q for one minion, but in general, I think the priority list is like if you can hit the enemy with the Q, it's better to hit the enemy with the Q and then last hit the minion with an auto, right? Because you'll get the same amount of stacks, but you're also putting your Scorch on cooldown, you're putting your Mana Flow on cooldown, you're getting the airy proc, right? The whole point of this airy page on Vega is to help you kind of get through lane, right? Because Vega is inherently a very weak champion. You know, he has a pretty high mana costs early game, right? Your, your E is 70, your W is 60, uh, it doesn't do too much damage. Obviously your Q is quite cheap, but uh, you know, your full combo will make you go um very, very quickly until you get that tier. So, um, you know, in general, your job on Vega is just to survive till the tier sort of tier refill. You, know, you can see here we're basing on 460. That's a very uncomfortable base for Vega. Um, in general, you want to base on at least 550. I think that's a pretty realistic base. Um, if you're having kind of a free lane, then I suggest you base on tier Dark Seal refillable. That's a really great base timer because it's 900 gold. And if you sort of force your enemy to base at the same time you do, you know, if it's a lost chapter champion that doesn't build tier, uh, they're not able to get lost chapter in time because they only have 900 and you sort of get a nice uh, favorable base for yourself. But once you do get tier, you can feel a lot more comfortable spamming out these combos on the enemy, actually uh, caging them with the E. You know, I think pre-first base, you just shouldn't use your E on the enemy unless there's a gank. You know, just conserve your mana, use it for Q stacks, right? Because if you waste two or three E's, that's 210 mana. That's, you know, seven potential Qs that you could have had, right? And one and a half stacks, stacks each, that's 10 AP lost. You know, if we're talking in an ideal world. So, um, yeah, Vega's definitely about playing for the late game. Uh, but he has great gank setup. That's the good thing about him. But one thing he doesn't have is escapes, right? So make sure you abuse his range. You know, his Q has been buffed multiple times. The range is longer now. It is a lot safer to get CS from afar. And, uh, you know, in these range matchups, don't expect to get some crazy trades. Just focus on queuing the wave, getting as many stacks as you can, and not getting hit. You know, and in the cage, this is something that people get very wrong. Stop trying to land both of your abilities, all right? When you Vega cage, the point of it is to condition the enemy to walk into your queue. That is it, guys. Yes, ideally you can land both QW, but it's very, very unrealistic. You just have to put your E down, right? Put your W and condition them to walk into your queue. So never put your W and Q in the same spot, right? In the cage. Just sort of put your W, he's forced to walk the other way, and then you guarantee the Q land, right? You would always rather land your Q than your W because first of all, you're maxing your Q, right? But secondly, you actually get the, you know, you get the AP stacks from it. So uh, your W is purely just the zoning tool, um, as is the cage in the early game, uh, to guarantee that your Q lands. And make sure you keep an eye on, you know, your mana flow, uh, your Scorch, things like that. Make sure that as soon as your Mana Flow is off cooldown, you really look for that that trade because it's very, very cheap. Mana Flow gives you back 25 Mana. Your Q costs 30, so it's quite literally free. 
Um, and I think level 6 is a really strong point for Vega. You know, his ultimate, another thing that's been buffed recently. And you can catch enemies off surprise like I did there, where he's not expecting my level up. Um, and I managed to hit him with the Q and last hit the minion uh, for level 6 at the same time. And he just uh, doesn't react, um, doesn't flash away because he doesn't expect it. And... Uh, yeah, Vega's also quite a mana-hungry uh, mana champion, so if you don't have to use your biscuits, um, you know, don't use them. You can hold on to them, and they can they can come in handy later on, because uh, the more points that you put in your queue, the higher the mana cost. So it becomes deceptively uh, more expensive. And here I'm thinking, look, my Kha'Zix was right next to me, he was in river, so maybe I could just, uh, you know, bait for him, but he chooses to gank top lane, and we actually grief our base timer. Make sure, guys, that if you ever cancel your base like that to go for a play, you know, you don't just continue the base. Like, you just have to stay an extra wave because you cancelled your base, right? Because you want to be basing right after you cleared a wave. And if you haven't cleared a wave, you just cancel it. You greet on the tower. You might drop a, you know, a minion or two. But Vega is fantastic at last hitting from afar, even if you're very low HP. If you're under your tower, really, there's very few champions that can pressure you. Uh, but that is the price, guys. That is the price of us uh, taking that late base. We are allowing our Hui to have a turn. And essentially force our Kha'Zix off the rift there. The Hui should have confidently forced the Kha'Zix off the rift because he knew that we had no teleport, he knew that we had low resources, a lot of gold to spend. Um, but for some reason he chickened out, not really sure why. Uh, but yeah, that, that's the price of, uh, you know, looking for an opportunistic play mid, you will lose an objective like like we should have with the Void Grubs. But uh, that's pretty much best case scenario for us. He didn't take the Void Grubs, which is fantastic. We get back to lane. And uh, look, even if your opponent is based, I think it is more important that you actually stack your AP rather than try to deny more CS. You know, most champions, when you see that base from, from Hui, that very late base, um, you would just try and crash this wave ASAP uh, just to deny one or two extra creeps. But I think on Vega, you actually rather just get the five or six, you know, um, five or six AP stacks rather than deny this whole wave and just let him have a couple CS. Because I think in the long term, right, once you get your death cap, you know, every single uh, point in your passive kind of multi uh, multiplies. Um, but that's pretty much what your mid game looks like on Vega. What I find also in terms of skill um, ability points, guys, I think it's very, very important to put two to three points. I think three is the sweet spot in your W. So you just leave your E on one, right? You max Q obviously, but then you leave your E on one and you put three points at W. Because if you put three points in W without DMATs, without anything like that, you'll be able to WQ the melee creeps and one shot them, right? And it just makes for a very easy sort of last hitting pattern and makes you have longer turns because you clear the wave faster, but it also doesn't sacrifice the stacks. If you actually fully max out your W, right? If you put five points in your W, you cannot use your W to prep your Q. You just can't because your W will literally one shot the creeps. That's how strong it is. They've buffed the AP scaling ratio on it. Um, so you kind of want to make sure that you, you put some points in W so that it's enough to get the, the WQ1 tap, but it's not too much where you can't actually farm the stacks. Um, outside of that, you know, you just kind of fish for max range Qs. Vega max range Qs is deceptively long range. Um, when the enemy is under tower, you just do this, you know, like we said, you just do this uh, little cage. You put the W kind of in the middle or slightly towards the side that they're on, and they either, you know, have to walk into your cage or take the W. And it uh, makes an easy Q hit as well. But don't worry about other lanes. I think that's one thing that you can get very wrong on Vega is you can try roaming. I think Vega has one of the best poke uh, abilities. You know, if you have the vision, if you have a ward down like I do, I've got that pink ward in the bot bush. It makes it very, very comfortable for me to push up here. I don't feel, uh, I don't feel pressured at all um, because I just have bot side to lean on, and I always uh, feel very safe. And that's a good combo as well with Vega. You know, your ult cannot be flashed from. Also, this Graves is an extremely Chinese player. So we know that if we just walk at him, he will try to kill us. You know, he's he's a skill checker. He will he will skill check you as soon as you get on a screen. And uh, yeah, sometimes you can pick up tendencies like that from players and uh, bait them in for an easy kill. But all in all, a very good start from us. Um, like I was saying before, that combo with the Q, Q flash ult on Vega is excellent because the Q flash means that they can't really react to your Q animation. So that's the only, you know, non point and click ability that you're casting. And then your ult point and click, and your ult actually follows flashes pretty well. I feel like most of the time, if the opponent flashes away, your ult will not be cancelled, unlike a lot of other uh, ranged abilities. Um, Vega ult's pretty good at following flashes, uh, it kind of just goes through anyway. Um, 
But yeah, this is definitely a really good point for us. I also think CD boots are by far the best boots. I know some people go Swifties, some people go Penshoes. Penshoes actually have the highest win rate on Vega, um, you know, across all ranks. But I think that's just, uh, it's kind of like placebo, you know? Like, I, I do think that CD boots allow you to just get more AP in lane. You know, you, you will just get more last hits in lane. And, uh, you know, you're a very vulnerable champion, so having the flash cooldown is also nice. And uh, yeah, just be happy with just landing one ability. You know, if you can use your cage to land W or Q, that's totally fine. Don't put yourself in a position to get traded on, right? Because Vega is all about free damage. If you play this champion at the highest level, it's about getting free damage because your range is so long. And um, you know, if you if you can get one free ability, it's better than casting two and landing two but taking a, a chunk in return. And uh, yeah, just kind of. This was a bit interesting, as a lot of people showed up mid, but uh, you know, because of our range is so long, we can just freely harass uh, without really putting ourselves in danger, and we're feeling confident. You know, we, we have we have a big a big lead, so we're just kind of <laughs> we've got our two we've got our jungle support here, and, and we feel very very comfortable. But for some reason, the enemy Janna just does a leeson kick on us, and and we actually uh, we actually feed away our bounty, which was pretty pointless, right? Because the whole point of getting mid prior is for the objective. And we've already secured mid prior, and there are two objectives up, right? So if we just don't die mid, my goal mid there was just to uh, stay alive, right? Maintain prior, you know, get a chip damage here and there, that's great. But never put myself in a position to die. Because as long as I don't die, look, the Hui has lost chapter, and we're sitting on, you know, Archangel. So as long as I don't die, there's never an opportunity for the enemy Graves to trade, right? Because if we start Dragon, and he starts Rift, I can just walk to Rift by myself and uh, contest them from it, right? But if we die, that's pretty much the only the only ability for us to, to lose one of the two objectives. So, um, you know, it's important sometimes in certain games, even if you're feeling very, very comfortable where you are, even if you're feeling very, very confident, just to realize, okay, what is my job right now? Is my job to make a play or is my job to just be there, to just generate prior, right? If I just automatically generate prior um, in this lane state with these items, then just, just stay there, you know, just maintain that lane state. Don't do anything that would risk uh, putting your, you know, your condition in jeopardy. And here, Hui, you know, he panics, he does the EE instead of EQ. And uh, once again, you know, we just... You don't have to land every ability on Vega. That's the nice thing about this champ. Like I said, if you just land your W or your Q in the cage, uh, most of the time it will be enough. Also, the other, the other reason why I really like cooldown boots is because you don't put any points in your E early, right? You're going to see me put three points in my W early and only one in my E. You know, this is level 11. You know, there's going to be team fights, And uh, if your E is longer cooldown, then ability haste actually has more value, right? Because it's actually reducing uh, more seconds, you know, relative to the cooldown. So, uh, yeah, I think I think just this build really synergizes with the, um, with the skill point. Uh, the skill point choices and... Should have definitely greeted for that plate. Um, I think I underestimated how much damage my creeps would do. Um, but at this point, I just feel like I'm so strong. You know, as long as I don't throw my lead like I did the first time, uh, if I just play a stable game, this should just be a free win. You know, again, um, whenever the objectives are up, my job is just mid prior on Vega. That's it. Now you can do this thing. This thing is very, very good to do, um, especially if there's a cannon wave. Uh, you can sort of use your E to stop the wave from coming in. Um, and hitting your tower and obviously hitting you as well, right? If you didn't have refillable, for example, that's a really good trick to use where you basically trade a little bit of your mana by casting your E to conserve your health, right? You conserve your health, you keep them there, you make sure that you get the max amount of stacks, Q stacks from it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, there's not really much to say about the lane. You just kind of, uh, you know, max range last hitting. If your creeps are alive, by the time the enemy creeps are dead, you walk with your wave. See if you can fish for something, you know, see if you can deny a CS. Even putting that, that Vega E down like that, it's kind of the same as a Hui W, right? If you've ever played Hui before, the way that, you know, if you have a wave shoved in, uh, you put the uh, Hui W behind the tower just to condition the enemy into either dropping the CS or, you know, obviously taking a big chunk or getting hit by one of your other abilities. I think Vega works in the same way as Hui. Actually, pretty decent pick into Hui, I think, um, you know. Uh, they have similar ranges. And they have, you know, I'd say Vega probably outscales Hui. So it's kind of like an outscaling lane where Hui should get prior, uh, but you're both kind of playing the same role in the team fights. Now here, we got a little bit too impatient. You know, the Graves is full HP. There's no reason to cage like that. I should just play for a max range Q poke. I think that's one of my biggest mistakes. You know, I'm still learning Vega. I'm still obviously, you know, I used to play a lot of Vega back in the Everfrost days, but um, haven't played him too much recently. So I'm still getting the hang of it. But the biggest thing about Vega now is because of the extension of his Q range right there again, you know, just there's no reason to cage like that. There's no reason to cage so early. Just save your cage. That's sort of like a disengage tool and be this 
annoying Pogue champion. Think about yourself as, you know, as Quirky, as Zerath. That is what you are, Vega, with Airy, with Scorch. That is what you can play like. You can play like a Quirky, where you walk up with your Q. Your Q is an extremely short cooldown. You know, again, with this build, I already have 50 ability haste. Actually, I have 58 ability haste. I'm not sure how I have 63. Uh, maybe it's a dragon or something, but I should have about 58, right, from the runes and the and the items. And uh, your Q is very, very low cooldown, and it's very non-committal. It's extremely long range. You know, it's um, it's very easy to just throw it out, and if you miss it, you just throw it out again. The most important thing on Vega is your position, because even though you do this Seraphs build, and you're like, okay, well, I have the 600, you know, shields and Seraphs and OP item, it is absolutely, but you've got no resist, you've got no other HP. Uh, so you will melt regardless. So your your cage is a really important tool, and it's important to use it not just as a way to restrict the enemy's movement, but um, as a defensive tool as well, right? The same way that we think about wards, I always say, look, a good ward is going to be something that gives you vision of at least two entrances. You know, ideally three entrances or three parts that the enemy jungle could take. You know, you want you want one action in the game to equal multiple things in League of Legends. Um, for it to be a, a considered an efficient action, right? And the same thing with your Vega Cage. If you're only using your Vega Cage to condition someone to get hit by your WQ, then you're exposing yourself, right? You're not getting the full value out of the ability. Now here, I have no idea what happened, to be honest. It looked like, to me, my W should have landed, but either my Q or W missed, yeah. and I didn't quite have enough damage to kill him, and then uh, we didn't realize he has Rylai's, and this bounce, this bounce just ends up getting us, and I mean, it's just, again, Kind of impatience. Same thing as the mid play, right? I'd, I'd say both of my deaths this game have come down to impatience, and this is something you can learn from as a Vega player as well. You know, Vega is just every single wave, you're going to be able to land a cage and just chip away a little bit of damage. Even if it's just one Q that you land in the cage, you will be able to get that free damage. You will never go oom, um, you know, so each wave you can chip your opponent lower. There's no reason to try and pull the trigger when they're three quarters health. You know, you could just wait. Wait for the next wave. They will be slightly lower, and it would come down to this burden of execution. You know, you don't need to execute perfectly. Put yourself in a position where even if you miss every ability but your ultimate, the enemy still dies. That's kind of how you should play Vega, right? And then if you land everything, then fantastic. You look, you know, you look sexy. You've, you've done the combo correctly. You've predicted the movement. Great. But if it, do, if it goes wrong, which it can, right? Because your abilities aren't guaranteed to land. You know, it, it's partially your skill. Yes, you're predicting the movement. Movement. But with a lot of champions, you know, they have dashing abilities, you know, it's, you're sort of relying on them playing badly and yourself playing well to actually land all of your spells. So I try not to put yourself in a position where, you know, you need to play perfectly on Vega, just kind of simplify the game if you can. And uh, if you miss something, don't be too harsh on yourself. You know, it's okay to miss stuff on Vega. Uh, you just kind of wait for your next cooldown. Make sure that that miss doesn't actually cost you any gold. They might, you know, it might there might be opportunity cost. You might have gotten gold if you hit those spells, but at least you don't lose any gold, right? At least you don't, you don't die uh, for, you know, poor sp skill shot accuracy uh, on Vega. And obviously, you know, once you once once your your bot tower dies or your mid tower dies, and you end up swapping lanes, I uh, just again always slow push on Vega. Don't feel too pressured to push the wave fast like you would with a normal champion. Your goal is just to stack your Q, right? Because by the time, as soon as you get that death cap second item, you want to have as much AP as possible. That is your biggest spike on Vega. Once you get Seraphs. Plus Death Cap, you've got a really healthy amount of cooldown reduction. You've got like 800 AP or something at 20 minutes when the other mage has 3, 400. You know that is the time where you you want to be grouping mid and uh, and and forcing stuff with your team. But until that point, you are a side lane champion on Vega. Okay, it might feel natural to A ram mid, but you do not want to A ram mid on Vega. You just want to get all of your all of your stacks done. You can see how much damage my autos do to the tower. That's the other thing that people don't think about on Vega is you essentially have an inbuilt Lich Bane. Like your passive is literally Lich Bane because your AP is converted uh, to damage against towers and uh, yeah, you just have so much AP that it's crazy. You know, uh, sometimes I feel like Vega does more damage to towers than Silas with Lich Bane. You know, you think, okay, Silas has Silas passive. He has Lich Bane. Surely he's one of the best tower takers in the game, you know, on par with Diana. No. Nah. It's just Vega autos. Vega autos are absolutely crazy. And Vega actually has a pretty decent attack speed, you know, scaling ratio as well. You know, once you get to higher levels, your attacks feel like they come out pretty quickly. Um, even if you don't take an attack speed shard in the early game. But yeah, you can see here, as soon as I get my death cap, boom, death cap, and make sure to buy pink ward, guys. Pink wards are invaluable on Vega because, you know, they guarantee the cages. Unfortunately, they did change uh, the very, very fun interaction with cages where you could put it 50% inside a wall, or rather like 51% inside a wall, and the opponent wouldn't see the animation. 
That used to be a very, very fun thing to do. Unfortunately, you cannot do that anymore. And just try and stay out of vision. You can see here, I'm just trying not to show, right? You want to stay in fog of war so that the opponent actually uses their movement ability and then you can quickly come out and get the cage, right? Because the, the downside of Vega Cage is that it takes so long to cast, you know? Um, you can be looking for it, but it, unless the opponent is right on top of you, you know, if they have any sort of dash, they'll be able to dash out of it before the cage actually pops. And then you're in a pretty significant cooldown, right? Um, so it's important that you're very patient with the cages. You know, even things like this. Uh, where we're doing cheeses like this. This is a great cheese, of course, this bush and the mid-bush as well. Uh, great positions to get the Vega ult. And here my big mistake was, look, I knew the Graves had no flash. If you know the opponent has no flash, and they're the most key, like, damage dealer in the game, just flash on them. You know, if we instantly kill that Graves without losing the Camille, because I committed my flash, we could just start the Baron right now. We could easily just hit the Baron 5v4 with no smite on the enemy team. But because our, one of our players is dead, you know, it feels very uncomfortable to start the Baron here, you know, 4v3 or things like that. And look, I thought that I had enough damage to actually kill this tower with autos, but my teammates didn't walk up with me, so I kind of lost confidence there. And uh, just an unnecessary force, right? We lost track of the uh, the Brand respawn timer as well, and just ended up feeding. So this one kill on Graves, that should have been game winning, right? If we just pull the trigger on that Graves, let's just go back to it so that you can sort of visualize... So we know that Graves has no flash. Your job on Vega a lot of the time isn't to actually one-shot people. It's just to keep them there. You know, like it doesn't matter whether you can one-shot the guy. If you can just flash cage him, uh, he will always die there in time. So, you know, as soon as the play is over, you've got to pick right now. What should I be doing here? You know, instead of going for this random pointless flank, what should we do, guys? After we get this pick, we have a we have a mad advantage on Baron. What's the number one step? If you guys want to take Baron, there are two things you need. Number one, you always need vision. Number two, you need mid prior. Okay, you need both of these things to be true. And if you don't have vision, then you just need to start with mid prior. You need to use your first turn, first mid wave, to get you know get prior, keep one of the champions mid, and then actually walk to Baron and uh, get Baron vision. And then you come back for a second mid wave. And on that second mid wave, once you already have the vision, then you can look to start the Baron. So here, what are we missing, guys? We have some vision. Our vision is not bad. Uh, we do have this nice ward over the wall. You always want to have either a ward here or a ward here to set up Barons and to make yourself, um, you know, to give yourself very easy turns with your cage. What are we missing? We're missing the mid prior. Who is the closest champion to get the mid prior? Normally, it would be Kaiser, right? Kaiser would be the champion that goes for mid prior. But right now, we're the closest person. So instead of going for these random kills that, look, they're three screens away from me. You know, there's no guarantees that I can catch up to these uh, two champions in time uh, to actually uh, to actually get the kills. Instead, we could contest this mid prior. We are much stronger than the Vayne. We can absolutely one-shot the Vayne with just Q flash QR, you know, at this point in the game. Instead, we drop the mid wave. Now, this Vayne's going to have a flank on us if she wants to after the the tier 2 tower, so we can never start this Baron. And, and that's what leads to this sort of compensation play, right? And it ends up being kind of good uh, because the Graves does walk in here, and here all we had to do was just flash cage him flash cage him so that even if he tries to dash out we put the cage so far behind him um, that he actually cannot uh, he cannot get out in time so uh, yeah look you can you can look at you can look at this you can look at uh, you know what happened here and the decision making here and it is questionable it is definitely questionable I should just push that top wave instead of trying to cut them off just push the top wave get the top tower guarantee you know some gold from this play the kill itself is meaningless unless we get some gold from it uh, but I get very, very greedy. I try to get an extra double kill here. My teammates don't follow up. They're not on the same page and it ends up being in this uh, feed fiesta. But the biggest thing I want you to take away from this is none of this matters. None of this execution matters. The only thing that matters is right here. The fact that as soon as we get a kill, what do we want to do? What is the closest objective that is, you know, the highest value? It is Baron. What is the prerequisite for Baron? It is mid prior, guys. You need mid prior to start Baron. Whether or not you're down a play, you need mid prior. Because if you don't get that mid prior, you can see we instantly lose our mid tower. So even if you know we fight successfully at the Baron, we're already down uh, some gold. Uh, but obviously, if one of us recalls to defend that mid wave, suddenly we're in a 4v4 at Baron, and uh, you know it just doesn't go well. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a rant, but I just think that uh, you know it's an important part of the game. Let's skip through to uh, what happens after this, after our depressing death. Oh, the enemy team ends up uh, actually starting Baron, which is, you know, makes sense. It is a 3v5. Uh, we also had our Kha'Zix die as a consequence of our bad decisions. And uh, we do TP in, you know, it's a little bit of compensation. But at the same time, we have pretty good positions here. And look here, all you have to do is just, again, play Vega like a Xerath. You know, just play, but just, just throw out the Q first. Don't commit your E, you know. 
don't walk melee range. Just throw out the Q, throw out the W. The opponents have nowhere to go. You know, if you're in this position at Dragon or at Baron, or even certain, you know, sometimes your opponent will be, uh, you know, pushing your base and you're coming from behind them. If they have nowhere to go, don't rush your cage. Your cage is such a long cooldown, the chances are, if you use it once, you're not going to get another opportunity. You know, you only get one cage for that skirmish, and it's better to hold it and wait for the right opportunity, wait for the escape spells to actually be used uh, to guarantee value out of it. Um, otherwise, you're just putting yourself in a you know in a bad position. The the three seconds that I spent forward uh, walking forward, putting the cage down, could have been you know my Q max range hit, and my Q is back off cooldown again. I I get a second Q. I don't get hit by the uh, the grave smoke screen. Smoke screen. How busted is that ability, by the way, guys? Whenever I get a graves on my team, this guy just runs it down. He takes your waves. He doesn't gank. He doesn't do objectives. He's just He's just useless. I swear. Graves on your team is useless. Enemy Graves locks it in. 1v9s. Smoke screen. You're stunned for 10 seconds. You know. You can't move. You can't cast anything. You can't see anything. I swear that ability is probably the most broken spell in League of Legends. You know. For, for a spell that you only put one point in. To essentially permanently disable a, a ranged champion. Is, is pretty crazy to me. But uh, yeah. Look. We lost the fight. Excuse me. And we obviously. Uh, you know. We haven't done. We haven't done any farming. You know. We died top lane on the, on the field dive. And then, uh, you know, we went to the Baron and we died again. So whenever you guys do that, if you ever find yourself chain feeding two times in a row, make sure that when you come out of base, you do not go to another random play, right? If you died and then you went to a random play and you died again, the next sequence has to be farming, okay? Otherwise, you're just going to fall way too far behind uh, on the clock. And you can see there, my autos are doing a lot of damage. That's what I was talking about, you know, on Vega. Uh, you can actually become the split pusher. You know, you could, you could match how fast the enemy AD carry takes your base uh, if you split push on Vega. And uh, we see that the wave was actually defended there, so that was important, guys. It's important that when you do play side lanes, you actually do move your camera and assess the wave state, right? We had to assess that, okay, is there urgency? Is our team going to die without us? You know, does it look like we're going to lose our base? Are they going to die of our teammates? And if they are, then absolutely, we should uh, we should recall earlier. But here, we're in a pretty good position where, you know, if Huey walks into us, we, we can go for this play. We get the Huey flash. Uh, but now the, the entire enemy team is rotating to us. It's still very, very good because, remember, they still have Baron, right? So if they're chasing us here, even if they kill us here, that is one of the reasons why we actually commit for this kill is because, look, we can't guarantee that we're going to get away, right? If we run this way, we don't know which, which way the Graves is going to chase us maybe they have blue trinkets maybe they have a jana walking out of base with a, 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 a crap ton of move speed whatever it is um we essentially gave our team an opportunity to 4v2 mid lane there but they didn't recognize it they didn't pull the trigger fast enough but that was a very very good play you know that is one of the ways that you can use split pushing to defuse uh, to defuse a Baron situation is where you, you know, you trade one for zero for their split pusher, and they essentially have to um, have to send more people towards you. Yes, you will die, but one, you're wasting the Baron buff, and two, if your teammates are smart about it, if they can read the movements of the enemy team, they could also pull the trigger mid lane uh, with a man advantage situation, and maybe even get a second kill. Um, now, obviously, we did get our item off that play, so at this point, we don't really get any stronger. You know, we've got our Seraphs, we've got our Zonyas, which... Uh, I bought a little bit, it was a bit of an emotional purchase, I think most of the time Crypt, uh, Crypt Bloom is the best item on Vega because he has one of the highest AP, you know, actually the highest AP amount in the game, right, out of any champion at every stage of the game, and uh, Crypt Bloom has a, a very good AP ratio on the healing, so you become the sort of disruptive team fighter, and then uh, as soon as you get one kill, it's almost like having a Jinx in your comp, uh, as soon as you get Crypt Bloom on, on Vega, you get this massive heal on everybody, and the fight just uh, kind of gets one off one pick off. And remember again, your job at Towers, the same way that our job at the Baron was just to poke, just throw out a couple Qs and then commit with our E. Same thing with uh, at Towers, guys. Just throw out your W, throw out your Q, condition the enemies. Remember that your W gives you full vision of the bush, right? So just condition your enemies to, uh, to not walk up and take your tower. You know, even before the minions arrive, your ability costs are pretty low late game for Vega. So you don't need to commit for a play. You can just keep throwing them out and you know, you could miss five in a row, but it's if it's the sixth one that, that lands, it's kind of like Blitzhook. Like, the way you should think about Vega is it's 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 like playing Blitzcrank. You just keep throwing things out, eventually one will stick, and when it does, you get a free kill. And we can see our Camille is pressuring mid, right? So we were very, very patient with how we were going forward, but as soon as we see that our Camille is about to take the base, we know that somebody had to have recalled. 
they can't all be here. And if they are all here, that's great for us because no matter how well or poorly this fight goes, our Camille will take their entire base. Our Camille will take the inhib unless somebody's base. So um, it's kind of all about biding your time on Vega, you know, making sure that you don't get poked out so that as soon as you see you have a man advantage or you see that there's something to gain on the other side of the map, you actually have the tools to pull the trigger. That is something that a lot of mid laners don't have. You know, yeah, Azir maybe has that, um, but, but most other mids uh, either don't have the safety that Vega does with the Seraph Zonias or you know, because they're forced to build other items, uh, or obviously doesn't have the range of Vega to engage the fight. So I think uh, playing Vega, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's a very conflicting playstyle. Uh, there might be a fight where you're playing like a poke mage, like a Xerath, and you're really playing to conserve your own life. And then the very next fight, you know that, you know, their AD carry is a jinx, she doesn't have flash, you just immediately flash cage forward. Zonyas, you know, drop down your W ult on the jinx, WQ ult, Zonyas, and the fight's won. You can, you can really, if you're somebody who enjoys playing Azir, if you enjoy playing Lissandra, even TF, things like that, Vega can fill a very similar role. Um, he absolutely can, and you know, here, another big mistake again, I'm trying to do the cages that are uh, invisible in the wall, uh, but it actually is not invisible, so it doesn't work, so... Uh, I think nowadays on Vega, instead of trying to, like, uh, basically catch people walking in, with your cage, you should just be doing max range Q poke. Like that is your job on Vega. Max range Q poke, max range Q poke, and then only once you're at threat of being engaged, then you throw down a cage. Because the cooldown is just too high. Uh, you, you know, you don't max it first, and uh, if you waste it, you're pretty much dead. Uh, no matter how many save tools you have. I'm not sure really what happened in that Baron. Somehow the vein flanked us. Um, not too sure what happened there, to be honest. Um, in the game, I was just as confused. But look, we got the Baron. I think the main issue there was me just not picking off the brand, right? If I sat in that uh, closed bush to Baron at the red buff and I just let the Baron, uh, let the brand face check, if I just press my QR here, you know, he's dead. Unless he presses Zonyas, he has no magic resist. I uh, only has a little bit of HP from the Leandries. And, you know, this could have been just uh, goodbye here. If, if our teammates played a little bit worse, if our teammates did not realize how important it was to clear the wave, but they did clear the wave and uh, we get away with another chance at life. So, look, this game wasn't perfect. It certainly was scrappy, um, but it was an exciting one to watch. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd chuck it up on YouTube. I thought it'd, it'd be uh, it'd be enjoyable to watch, uh, just to see that, you know, you don't have to be the best player in the world to play Vega. You know, I want the people to be watching this uh, that, that they haven't played Vega before to get inspired to play him. Because I, the first Vega I pl game I played in, in a very long time, I think I went like 0-5 in lane, and then as soon as we went to these team fights, and I was able to cage properly, and I was able to zone, and you know, I ended up going from 0-5 from to like 10-5, and we won the game. So I, I think the champions is actually in, in a great spot right now, you know. His items are very, very strong. Deathcap, great item. Seraphs, great item. Um, you know, Airy, one of the one of the pages that hasn't really been nerfed um, as much as the other ones, right? The AP ratio on the Airy hasn't been affected nearly as much as Comet, Electrocute, you know. And uh, it's all about patience, right? Like, it's about hoarding your summoner spells until you get the high value kills there. You know, we, we had the opportunity to use our summoners at the Baron. We held them because we want to make sure that when we kill people, we get objectives from it. Here, that double kill guaranteed us in the inhib. And uh, this was a bit unfortunate that our wave actually got stuck on the uh, on the enemy minions. Because if it didn't, you know, two more autos in that, on that tower and we kill it. Even one auto and we kill it. And we could have potentially gone for the end here. I really did want to go for the end here. I felt very, very comfortable uh, with... You know, my gold, my items, and I also have my ult coming up. So if we were able to get a kill on Hui there, a kill on Brand, once the Graves respawns, I, I have my ultimate, we could potentially, you know, force the chain feed and end the game. So that's a really good play to go for. I think that is a, a really great end call to go for there, even though it didn't work out for us. Like, yes, it was risky, but the most important thing is we've already killed the mid wave. So even if we die there, who cares? They can't end the game, right? Because it's going to take them way too long to get across the map. And, uh,. You know, uh, we, we have our wave alive still, so if we do win the fight, we can just instantly end the game. So, make sure to recognize opportunities like that, you know, like, what are we going to lose if I go for this play? Like, is this a guaranteed play? No, it's not. But what is there to gain? Well, there is a nexus to gain. What is there to lose? Well, just 300 gold, you know, or 450 gold um, with an assist. So, uh, definitely a worthwhile attempt. Doesn't quite work out. And uh, now it's up to you to decide, like, what do you play for, right? You know, when you're thinking late game, what are we playing for? It's kind of, what, what's the next objective? Next objective is Dragon. Can we give this Dragon up? Is this an important Drake? It is the soul, so we cannot give it up. How do we contest this Dragon? Well, we should just walk through mid, right? Always ping your team. 
excuse me, whenever you're playing a control mage, you ping your teammates to go with your mid. Do not walk side lane. Farm is irrelevant at this point in the game. You know, we have 1,100 AP. You know, it doesn't matter if we have 1.2k or 1.1k, who cares? The only thing that matters is, is our mid wave alive? Is their mid wave alive, right? Because if your mid wave is alive and you win a play, you end the game. If their mid wave is alive and they win a play, they end the game. If both mid waves are dead and you lose the dragon, then the game goes on. You know, like, yes, it's going to be, you know, 20% extra chance for them to win. Maybe it's going to be like an 80%. Uh, win chance for them with the mountain soul it's a very good soul but we can still win the game right so this is why you can see the good players in this game are all are all going for the waves you know the graves wants to catch the waves i want to catch the wave my teammates don't share the same sentiment you know they're, they're looking for poke on the champs the only thing we need to do in this position is just to kill the wave right and walk to the objective kill the wave walk to the objective in this case our Kabil is actually making great progress in their base and uh, I didn't really see this, to be honest, in the game. I didn't realize my Camille killed the Huey. If I saw this, I should have just immediately teleported on top of Camille here. And we could absolutely just end the game. We could absolutely just end the game, uh, you know, ping our teammates to, to start chain feeding um, to stop their bases. There's no Baron on the enemies. Uh, you know, we can two-shot the, 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 the towers with our auto-attacks. And we could have absolutely ended the game there. But uh, a missed opportunity, you know. Uh, just something to keep in mind when you're playing Vega, you are very similar to a TF, to a Diana, to a Silas. If there is an opportunity to TP into the enemy base and there is a wave, you will watch out the Nexus. You know, you, you will kill it very, very quickly. Uh, but alternatively, you can always, you know, recall and defend. You know, that's that's the great thing about Vega. He's great at defending and he's also great at, uh, at, at taking the enemy... Uh, the enemy base reps. I think all the other champions I mentioned, you know, Diana, Silas, unless you get a really good Silas ult, you know, like Lux or Ezreal or something, um, you're not great at actually wave clearing. And here, again, I'm trying to get mid prior to push for Baron, but somehow the enemy team actually cheesed us. And this is one of those plays that is very, very high level. This is a hard play to expect, because from my perspective, we had four people alive there, and they had no information about my Camille, right? My Camille was walking out of base in Fog of War through bot lane, um, and if she was mid there, that would have been a 3v3, you know, for a couple of seconds into a 4v3, into a 5v3 for them. So it's a very, very risky play to go for them. If they don't kill me instantly in that play, they do kind of all die and lose the game, right? Because we've, we're going to just walk our wave, uh, protect our wave, and uh, kill them at the Nexus. Because uh, it is it is late at this point in the game. It is getting late. You know, the later it goes, the longer the timers are. If you do get aced, even if it's in the enemy base, you will... Um, you can still absolutely lose the game, so... Yeah, I mean, it's well played for them. That's why, uh, you know, this this is a game that I enjoyed playing because the enemy team actually made pretty good decisions. You know, it, it felt like there was some uh, comical moments in this game, but uh, a lot of the time you watch it and you're like, you know, that's well played. That's a really good, you know, fast play to go for that, that I wouldn't normally expect. Um... And yeah, if your team already has control of an area and you feel like the enemy is not going to retake it straight away, if you feel like there's no urgency for the enemy to retake it, you can absolutely just push another way of, uh, on Vega. I think especially if you go for this defensive itemization like I did with the Zonyas, with the Banshees, I feel like I can sideline against anyone in this game. You know, I feel like there's no champion here that can absolutely one-tap me. You know, um, I see the Graves was actually cheesing me in this bush. What an absolute pig. Uh, that is such a disgusting cheese to go for. And we can see that our teammates are pushing the enemy base. And that's why we feel very comfortable going for this flash here. Because Huey is their main wave clear tool. You know, and our teammates have a 4v4 right now. We have the TP. So if our team just went even, if our team just didn't die here. Right, if they just stayed alive and killed this bot tower. We could potentially look to end the game. You know, and uh, it is my bad for teleporting a little bit too early. Uh, without assessing, I kind of just immediately teleported. Instead of assessing and then uh, looking to TP. And seeing that my teammates have already lost the fight. And there was no way for me to recover it. Um, but we try to make the most out of it. You know, we try to... Uh, what is Graves thinking? Graves is thinking, look, the enemy team has to be basing, right? To, to defend their base. And that is why we are not basing, right? We sacrifice our Nexus Tower. Because the Graves knows that if we, you know, if we do this play, we're going to lose the Nexus Tower. But, you know, we get a nice shot down on Graves. Um, was it worth it? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Obviously, it's a lot harder to win the game when you lose your... Nexus Tower because you're always up for a backdoor. Uh, fortunately, they don't really have any good backdoor champions. Their only TP champion is Huey. Uh, doesn't do particularly well against a Nexus. And uh, we do want to stay on the map. You know, when you kill the strongest member of the enemy team, you have to try and, again, force out the chain feed. Like I always say, you have to stay on the map and try and pressure the base. Uh, try and force out a mistake. We do end up basing here just because we have enough uh, money for our Banshees and our Blue Pot. Um, 
and we don't really have a wave to do anything but yeah our teammates should have really just ran down mid and uh, pressured this inhib on this wave that's in the middle right now and we should have been there on the same timer with them uh, but it's a little bit slow a little bit sloppy and we miss out our opportunity graves is now alive and when it's 5v5 guys it doesn't matter how strong you feel it doesn't matter if you're playing great siege champion like vega do not walk into the enemy base there are too many angles that you can be flanked from you know you can see here karma doing a great job setting up our bot side you know vision but what happens if you get flanked topside? What happens if one of the enemy champions walks like this and just kills our whole base, right? Because our base is exposed right now. So it's very, very important as we're walking through here. That's the reason why I placed this blue trinket in our jungle. You know, you cover the backdoor angles. We know that if we just, uh, you know, if we just keep them in their base, one, we're just permanently getting more farm, and two, we're going to have access to both the objectives as soon as they're up. The only way we can lose this game is to a backdoor, and the only champion that can backdoor us realistically is Graves. So as long as we kind of, obviously Vayne as well, right? As long as we see Vayne and Graves on the map, um, we're very safe from a backdoor. So we actually just want to stay here. It might feel like you're accomplishing nothing, but if you give up the space, if you allow them to, to leave, right now there's only two entrances that they can backdoor through, right? Like this, thread this. And we can cover these two entrances with wards, right? Because our waves are like additional wards as well. So we've, there's four there's four ways out of the base for them, or five rather. And we've got three waves spotting them. And uh, we've got wards spotting the other side. And uh, yeah, we, we, we can just expect that uh, if the enemy team... You know, if the objective is here and the enemy team has no control, what is the most likely thing for them to do? If you have no control of an objective, you go for a trade, right? You try and trade something on the other side. In this case, the trade would be our Nexus. So uh, that was kind of a, a game winning a read, I suppose, knowing that, okay, if Graves is missing, if Vayne is missing, there's a good chance that they are going to backdoor us. And then you ask, okay, well, if they're going to come and backdoor, which side are they going to do it from? Well, we're controlling the bot side very heavily. Um, so it makes more sense for them to try and time their back door with the dragon spawning and come through our top side and uh, yeah look uh, you know a bit of an anticlimactic end to the end to the game it wasn't some crazy mechanical outplays it was literally just uh, reading the intention but yeah try out Vega is, is a lot of fun and uh, can bring you a lot of LP and solo right now